the goal for today's uh, webinar workshop, I call it a workshop because the intent here is to take questions um, and really be able to, you know, if, if there's anything in particular I can go over, um, you know, have access to me for a while and just, you know, be able to answer any questions. And so the idea of today's uh, conversation, though, is about proving project concepts. And the reason why, you know, I'm doing this is because it's so important to be able to actually convince ourselves that the project is something that is worth doing, something that we want to move forward with before we end up spending a ton of time and money going in a direction that either doesn't make sense or ends up being something that we're just not sort of happy with when we actually look at some numbers or when we actually get drawings from an architect down the road. Um, and I'll show you why and how we can really try to avoid some of this strategically. But a lot of this is really coming from, you know, on my YouTube channel, a lot of videos that are touching on different sort of smaller aspects of this. But this workshop is really sort of rolling a lot of it into uh, one presentation. And so the reason why I like to think this way in terms of trying to prove the project concept early is because this early phase here, the part in the red box, is the phase where we're not spending as much money. You are spending a lot of your own time, but you haven't really gone into these uh, the steps of documenting and building where you know the work at the very beginning has a lot to do with your own time, your own effort, you know, potentially consultants, someone like myself or other people who can help with this, attorneys who can answer specific questions, whatever the case is. But predominantly, it's a lot of time and maybe a little bit of money. And when you get to the documentation and building part, you know, it goes up orders of magnitude of, you know, many times over. So you go from spending a few percentage points to potentially 10 to 15 percent to document something to building it, you know, and going into the, you know, million, multiple millions of dollars, whatever it is. And so that's why in the framework that I follow and have just sort of put together to try to help explain this kind of thing. I look at this proving project concept phase as being one of the first things that we do, because that's really what we're, you know, what this is talking about is creating the parameters for the project, balancing the vision that we have with the risk attached and the finance as well. So it's really this, this mix of these three things. And that's why I, I've always structured it in this way where, you know, this idea that the purpose, people and profit, and that's really what we're going to be going through today. And the reason why I think this matters so much and the reason why something like purpose or passion is included in this is because for so many of us, the work that we're actually doing really does matter. Like we're making places that we really care about. We're not making, you know, a bottling facility. And there's also this bigger issue right now of, you know, these spaces that we used to have for third spaces as they were coined. Um, often are not as available anymore, or they have really changed in in nature. And what I mean by that is that the guy who coined that term, it, uh, Roy Oldenburg, this was back in the 80s. And, you know, the situation was very different. The The idea of live, work and third space, um, this is a quick tangent, was, was very different. You know, you were commuting to work, you were, you know, you're commuting between places. You know, as the 2000s went on, the idea that companies were trying to sort of collect more of your time by giving you activities in the office uh, became a thing. And, you know, as we've gone through the, the 2000s, open offices and all these different experiments sort of culminated in the early 2020s where all of this got put in a blender. And we ended up in a situation where, you know, home and school and our third space was just absolutely just chopped up. And it really hasn't gone back together yet because people are still figuring out, you know, going forward, what is it that we can do to connect the life that we have, the work that we presumably want to be doing? It's not about separating them. It's about how they all integrate together. And these third spaces, which are these things that we've known for a long time and intuitively we've always known that being together uh, is an important part of how we actually want to be spending our time and doing the activities that we sort of love. And so, you know, whether it's a climbing gym or uh, a co-working space, like these are very important places. These are often these sort of third spaces. And the reason why 
you know, I like to include uh, that sort of purpose or passion aspect is because without that, again, we're not creating these spaces that we really care about. And so the purpose and passion. So just going into this, the the three P's that I start with this idea of purpose and passion, you know, we're we're building something that is reflecting the mission that you have, like the passion that you have. What are you trying to share? And who is it that you're actually, you know, creating something for? You know, what is the community that you're actually uh, creating this for? And this sounds, I think, high level, but I'm going to show the subtlety in terms of how it affects the downstream decisions we make in just a minute. And profit, you know, profit, whether you're a nonprofit or a for profit, having financial stability is giving us the ability to fund the growth and sustain the future of the endeavor. And so what we're really talking about here is fundamentally establishing the rules of the game. You know, what are we doing? Which ballpark are we playing in? And when I show slides like this, I can think of projects that I've worked on that are the sort of backyard version, the sort of little league version, the kind of maybe souped up little league version or the, the bigger complex and all the way up to these kind of much more visionary ballparks or even today like a pseudo ballpark, like what does it mean with the technology or the sort of, uh, you know, proximities that we have, whether it's with board climbing or uh, other sort of, you know, equivalencies to other bigger things that are activities that we can actually uh, kind of mimic with different technologies that we have. And, you know, again, the, the reason why I like to focus on this work is because this is where we're making so many decisions. And so if we jump into you know, passion and purpose. What I really mean by that is that, you know, I, I started a lot of the work I'm doing now with climbing gyms. And this really started almost, almost 20 years ago now uh, with gyms in particular. And, you know, I started in it because it was a passion of mine. And I do think that there's a big difference between, you know, something like a climbing gym and something like, you know, a trampoline park as an example, because this is not necessarily someplace that you're going four times a week. And it just is a fundamentally different kind of place, even though both of them are options of ways to be spending your time. And this is why, you know, starting with goals and mindset that for anybody who's worked with me, this is why we start here is because this becomes the baseline. And very often it has a lot to do with, you know, what is it that we're trying to share? You know, is it for kids? Is it not for kids? Is it for high level athletes? Like what is the mix of that? You know, what kind of events are we looking to do? Who are we trying to bring in? And fundamentally, you know, asking that question of, you know, what is it about you and your passion, your vision for the project that is going to be the thing that identifies you uh, from other groups? And so, you know, whether it's a project like this, which is this real mix of, you know, climbing and skateboarding and surfing or, even things like pickle and fitness or uh, parkour and ramps or more traditional kind of not down the middle, but, you know, kind of traditional climbing facilities. You know, how is it that what is the version of this that we're actually trying to share? And the people aspect of it is important because this is the community that we're actually trying to reach out to. You know, who are the people we're actually trying to serve? And part of the issue that I see a lot that's a real opportunity is they might be asking, they might not even know what it is that you're trying to share. You know, when you're building climbing facilities, for example, in cities, you're not necessarily going to a market that understands or has that passion already. And so, you know, we're creating these things that are attracting people because we're putting them in spaces that make sense. We're running a business that's attracting people in a way that they want to be a part of. And, you know, a lot of businesses talk about community, but it's not a community because you say so. It's a community when you actually do it properly and you bring people in and, and who are the people you're bringing in who may be sort of tangential to what it is that you're doing, providing space for these different things, providing space for these different, you know, things that might be, again, interests of yours, even if it's not necessarily what the facility is made for. And one of my, I think, favorite examples right now is uh, a project that I did with Woodward where the center that we put together for them was called the progression center because they had this realization and their branding here, you know, uh, every skill level, what they had realized is that most of their stuff in Pennsylvania specifically was really scary. 
these gigantic ramps. And if you're trying to, if these are the people you're trying to cater to, this is not it. And so these types of centers were actually really geared and envisioned from the very first conversations to be built for progression, not just for, um, you know, the, <laughs> the biggest whatever you can do. So very different focus on who the people are that they're actually serving. So same passion, same purpose, you know, bikes and ramps and skateboarding different version of that profile of the person you're serving. Just in the same way that when I look at a climbing gym like this versus one like this, there's a big difference in terms of who they're actually trying to serve, in my opinion. And in both cases, the it also has to do with where the money's coming from. So how is that part of it being baked into it? Because one of them is sort of a serial chain, if you will, and one of them is much more geared to creating more of a real third space. And I think it's pretty clear which one of those images is which just when you look at this. And I mentioned profit being the third sort of piece that I like to think about balancing because it's what ensures the financial stability for us to grow and really control our own destiny going forward. And whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer in a way because you know the NFL was a nonprofit for a long time, and it was a it's a thirteen billion dollar industry. Um, you know, granted the NFL proper wasn't making that much, but it was clearly enough where its tax exempt status was was questioned. They gave it up. But my point is, is that it's not about making money or not, because nonprofits need to the more self sustaining they can be, I think the better off they are. And again, that comes down to choosing your own destiny. And something I've talked about in the past, which is, you know, who it is that we partner with uh, has a lot to do with how we look at profit. So a group like 10 Gram, who is uh, a private equity group, you know, their stated goal on their website has a lot more to do with um, acquiring highly recognizable brands. Their job is to buy brands. That's what they do. That's what they say. You know, so they're the sort of gobbling uh, cookie monster versus, you know, what are you trying to actually do with your business. And that's to me the biggest difference between when you, when your profit concerns or are supported by private equity versus some investors who really care about what it is, the fingerprint for your project is going to be very different. And I talk about it as in judging success because it's not one or the other. You know, what is it that we're actually trying to do here? And I, I use a lot of food metaphors, but, you know, are we trying to make something sweet or salty? And what are the ingredients that we're trying to actually uh, use? You know, is it is it are we doing camps? Are we doing, you know, skating? Are we doing co-working? What, what is it that we're actually putting together? Because when we actually take that intent and sort of map it out onto a model like this, you know, when I think of clients I've worked with that are more of a public or nonprofit orientation, you know, they in this chart, they sort of mark up to the left where, you know, they're sort of community focused. They have a longer term view, service oriented, you know, a lot of exploration usually. Um, and it's just generally speaking in that sort of quadrant of, of uh, discovery, really, and versus private equity groups that I've worked with. Where, you know, the, the profit and the sort of short term and frankly, self-interest is going to be pulling a lot more gravity uh, down with it. And, you know, comparing both of those to more of a generational business where it's, it's really something that you're not necessarily looking to get rid of. And in all of these cases, profit is something that has to be considered, but it's just what else and what is the sort of time horizon that I think is being looked at is, is an important consideration within it. And in terms of how we are focusing on things, you know, different aspects of how we look at profit, how we look at technology, how we look at community, like what are these sort of themes we're focusing on? And when I look at a lot of the private equity groups that I've been involved with, you know, a lot of it, yes, we say we're touching on community. Yes, we say we're working on, you know, co-working or, or play elements or whatever it is, but it, it's sort of often not as uh, grand or as ambitious as some of the other groups I've worked with that are, they go so hard at certain directions, whether it's, you know, the, the play element of, of climbing or 
the way that we are bringing community together or, you know, a group that I work with that does daycare, co-working, fitness, you know, the education aspect and the community aspect, like these, these profiles become so different when the ambition and the vision for the purpose that they're sharing is, is much more sort of high level. And so when you put these two things together, they really do create very different profiles from, you know, just visually speaking, what are we really focusing on and how ambitious are we getting here? Because when it comes down to when we're looking at profit to try to figure what, out what that even means, you know, this high level uh, financial planning that it doesn't really matter what the tools are that you're using. As long as we're trying to get an understanding of the inputs, meaning the investment to get the building open versus the outputs on the other end. And along the way, you know, what are these uh, elements that we're adding? What are the ingredients that we're adding and how do they affect that bottom line? Because what we end up doing is adjusting all of that up and down. We can start seeing predictions, we can start doing budgeting. And what ends up happening is that, you know, looking at fitness, for example, uh, an Equinox versus a Planet Fitness, they're, the reason they look so different in these two pictures is because of all of what we've just been talking about. They're trying to share something that's different, even though they're both with fitness, they're trying to share something that is very different in terms of who they're serving. So the, the, the sort of passion is still somewhat similar, but the people they're serving is wildly different as is the profit goal and the business model that is supporting that. And so it really does come down to, it ends up showing up in the physical space as well. And so when I talk about this, you know, the question really is like, why does it matter? And it's because we don't just put this stuff together. We have to mix it. And for me, what it does is it becomes the filter that we can use as you are, say, looking at real estate, because you can have an idea about what you can afford. And if you pay more, what does that do to the bottom line? If you're paying less, what does that do to the bottom line? When we're sketching things, we can understand, are we actually including the ingredients that we need to serve the, the purpose we're trying to share and the people we're trying to serve? And, you know, is that actually tracking all the way through the process? And the reason why I focus on that and think it's so important to do that with clients at the beginning is because if you start going it too far, so say you uh, get a little bit further and I've when I work with people who've done this, it, the problem is often they've invested their budget already. So there's very little left. If you are documenting something and you're going through working with an architect, maybe you're spending a hundred thousand dollars on that and you find out that, Oh, actually we don't like it. Maybe the estimates were coming in way higher, you know, two or three times, uh, for example, that I've seen, uh, what you were hoping to spend. This is a tough time to figure that out because you not only have to redo a lot of that work, you're going to have to rethink about your fundamental assumptions that, frankly, that's why we're trying to do it earlier because then we're not having to kind of amputate part of the projects because you're already now spending again. You're not just, you know, you can reuse some of that work, but you inevitably end up having to spend a lot more to get back to the point where you're ready to sort of launch your project and move it, move it forward. And so when I talk about these three things, the people that we're serving, uh, the purpose, what is it that we're sharing and the profit that comes out sort of on the other end, you know, this is an example of a project that we're currently working on that is doing that, you know, it's a mix of, of climbing, skating and surfing. I showed this a minute ago, but it, it's really being looked at as, why are we trying to create this community center that's based on these things? How do the numbers shake out? You know, what is it that's coming together for this thing to make it actually work? And, you know, who is it that we're actually trying to bring in? And are we giving those people the right elements, the right features, the right, uh, you know, program pieces to support them and make them want to come here and also come back? And so just a real quick uh, summary of this. So if I had to break it down into sort of steps, you know, to me, it's about that first step of clarifying uh, the intent. So and I mean that in almost a narrative fashion where what is it that you're trying to do and what is the identity that you're actually looking to 
uh, develop that is unique to you. And, you know, number two, defining success as in, you know, what is it that we're actually trying to do from a financial point of view? You know, what is it that we actually are trying to uh, get to in terms of, you know, how are we going to look at success? Is it purely on profit numbers? Is it on like purely EBITDA or is that just a reference point? And it depends a lot on who you're working with in terms of how they're going to look at that. You know, determining the ingredients, once we are figuring out who we're actually looking to be serving and what we're trying to share with them, you know, what are the pieces we're actually working with? And a lot of this ends up coming down to the fact that if you're a smaller facility, you just simply can't put everything in. So these questions sort of go into a bit of a pressure cooker where you have to really figure out, you know, and really think through what it is that you're really uh, trying to do, because as you have to make cuts, those decisions and that baseline you've established becomes even more important. And I call it a 30,000 foot business view. Um, you know, often I call it 30 second math because, you know, being able to have a, a high level ballpark of what it is that you are uh, trying to do from a business point of view at the beginning can really just help us really quickly and very rapidly make decisions. Because often people come to me and they have ideas about what they want to build. And, you know, frankly, it's often way more than I think what they end up wanting to raise. And so by being able to have those conversations earlier, it really just helps us again, establish that ballpark that we're playing in. You know, if you're not wanting to raise or if you don't think you can raise, you know, eight, 10, $12 million, it's very different than, you know, doing a project that's one and a half, two or $3 million. And that simple decision or that simple reality can really help us frame how we do a lot of things from real estate. Are we building? Are we leasing? Uh, how are we trying to raise money? timelines, all of these different things. So that sort of conceptual business view at the beginning, before we're really drawing things. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people coming to me with buildings that are pretty much drawn that they then price and are just sort of befuddled and effectively at a stopping point because they've often spent 50, 75, 100,000 or more on a building that frankly, isn't really is probably more than what they need, but certainly isn't something they can afford. And they're, they're kind of at a stopping point and it's a lot of wasted time and money. And if we, the other way to do it though, is that we can just adjust the dials of development. So as we work through that model, you know, we can understand how much we can afford in rent, how much we need to bring in, you know, what often happens as well is people might not think that they uh, want to have kids programming or something like that. But when you think about, well, are we going to be bringing in enough without it? Or maybe we only want to do kids programming, but do we need to do anything else on top of that? Again, you can see there's not really one or one right or wrong answer. It's about figuring it out though, and creating that fingerprint for your project. And if we have that kind of a package put together, that really allows us to uh, figure out what next steps would actually be. And what I think is good about that is that you can decide at that point, you know, do we want to raise money? Do we want to do a seed round of funding? Do we want to try to, uh, you know, begin raising money for, for building this whole thing out? Because you've actually got a much more compelling narrative. You've got a story, you understand what the metrics are for success. You can explain, you know, what the pieces are that you're putting together that support those earlier ideas and assumptions. And that all fits into that sort of higher level business model view. And as you look at the market, as you see real estate, it's all about adjustment because there's not really one right or wrong place to start because so many people come to me with very, very different uh, starting points. Some have money, some have land, some have nothing. And so no matter what, in my mind, coming together and putting all of this, you know, sort of in a way that we understand is really what allows us to determine the next steps. Because in some people's case, you know, it's just very different. If you, uh, you know, if you don't have money, then we need to look at that. If you have real estate, then that might be something we can actually dig into a little bit more, whatever the case is. 
this sort of understanding this, th and this is to me, what proving the project concept is really all about is that this is how we prove it. And if you note, a lot of this isn't even really talking about visuals. I, I think that the visuals are an important part of it, but at the same time, if we don't have an idea about what this stuff is, you know, I really would prefer not to draw anything anyway, because what are we really sort of drawing up? Um, and that's a little bit different if you're an existing business who is testing new concepts, because a lot of this you already know. You've already got an idea about your existing business. So the Woodward project I was showing, for instance, they understand their business like they kind of they think about this stuff a lot. And so they are ready to sort of take their baseline and look at it from a uh, kind of next step point of view and in terms of a new concept, how it relates to all the work they've already done. If you're just starting a business or expanding or evolving your business, um, I think that this is the kind of checklist, though, that you, you want to make sure that you're actually going through to prove the concept before you start spending a lot more time uh, doing other things. And just as a, a reference, all of what I've been talking about, bits and pieces of this are in a lot of the videos that are on my YouTube channel now. If you would like uh, more sort of commentary on some of this, you know, the narrative architecture part uh, in the upper right, I talk a lot about that because I think the more that you can clearly articulate what you're doing, it helps us keep on track. It helps other people understand what we're doing and how to prioritize things. Um, you know, figuring out where to start your project, uh, identity as a strategy. Um, and a lot of this stuff has, these ones have a lot more to do with, uh, you know, money. You know, what's the minimum viable project that you are able to do? You know, if you had to strip it back, because what, what often happens is as you do the numbers, as you look at things, you'll go, wow, like this is just a lot more expensive than we thought. So being able to go back to what are our fundamental goals and what is our real mission here? We might be able to think of a minimum viable building that is actually quite a bit more simple than maybe what your initial vision was. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but maybe that's even step two or three down the road. Maybe the initial one is actually a little different. And this is pretty common for a lot of businesses to sort of you know grow into larger facilities. And then finally, you know, the idea of as you're moving forward, the dials of development, you know, some landlords have a lot to do, uh, have a lot of interest in just the bottom line. Other ones are much more interested in you and your story. And, you know, guess what? If you're doing something that you're starting a business or doing something that's kind of interesting, somebody who just wants a national level sort of uh, retail partner might not be your client. I can almost guarantee they're not going to be the landlord that actually wants you to come in. You really do need landlords who like what you're doing and are sort of boosters for the project. And this idea of filters, these are the filters that we have so that we can move forward. So if you're looking at land or a building and it's just really, really expensive, you can filter that out and move forward because you, you understand what it is you can and can't do. And finally, keeping options open. One thing I will say for people who are developing projects on the call is that things change a lot for different reasons. Uh, real estate in particular often changes in terms of you know what space you're looking at. A lot of people, when I talk to them, have a space in mind, might even have a letter of intent, not a lease, but an LOI. And I would still say so many, so many times they move, something moves, maybe the landlord just sort of goes cold or whatever the reason is, for some reason, and especially in real estate, even people who have money and are ready to go, I've still had it to have it take a very long time to get through finding and getting a lease. And so having options open, I always recommend is the way to be able to pro apply genuine leverage without having to make things up. When you have a couple of, which is, you know, don't do that. When you have multiple options, gen uh, genuinely going forward, it's a great way to be able to apply pressure because you're trying, you, you can just use people uh, as, as you're making decisions uh, to help other people either stay in the game or get out of the game or whatever. And that helps a lot with landlords. And so just to wrap up, and then I'll be open for uh, any questions or chat. 
Um, you know, thank you very much for tuning in. This was just a quick, uh, the first part of this. For anybody who wants to reach out to me, uh, you can find me through my website. Uh, and there's a booking page that, again, you can find through my website, but it's just chrisryanstudio.com slash booking. And, you know, the framework that I was showing you is what we, uh, you know, what I use and I use it to organize things as well. So for people who are even at the very beginning of what we talked about, that's really what that launch program is for. And as you move through proving the concept, that's where the, the idea of rapid visualization uh, comes in. And, you know, I think that's an important part of proving the concept, but it's hard to visualize things when we don't actually have the metrics we're using to judge it for success. So that's just uh, how I look at proving a project concept. And again, thank you very much for uh, being here today. And I'm totally open. If you want to fire questions uh, into the chat or you should be able to raise your hand too. Otherwise, um, we can call it a morning. But again, thank you. Just keep an eye out. Yeah, so just one thing that's coming through. Let me just go back a little bit. You know, I started, um, I started with one of the slides at the very beginning here. So I didn't talk about this a lot, um, but, you know, for me, this is really the reason why we're, we're doing this work and why so much of the work that I focus on is, is geared in this idea of third spaces, which again, I, I think is, is an outdated kind of term, but the intent I think is still good, but there's this changing pattern in, you know, the world today where we're very digital um, urbanization has changed quite a bit. There's sort of fewer and fewer like real public spaces. There's changing social structures, meaning a lot of the places that we used to gather, you know, a lot of it used, a lot of times it used to be uh, religious, you know, venues, church or whatever. And a lot of these things are just very different. And additionally, changing work patterns, changing li uh, life and work patterns. And those have changed so much, especially in the last few years, that we are still dealing with that where, you know, you're ex more accessible than ever. And again, a lot of this is cliches, but I think what we're, we all know this, but I think what's happening is that the impact that it's having on our lives is really significant. And the more and more it's looked at, the more, you know, people have really uh, kind of gone back to this idea of the return to real experiences. And, you know, you hear about experiential uh, retail and different ideas like that, because all of those sort of changing patterns have resulted in a real rise in isolation. If you just go up to the resulting issues, loss of connections and community, you know, a lot of people really uh, losing connection to other groups a lack of balance between life and work, you know, being just available all the time and fundamentally a lot more physical and mental health issues. And so, you know, the people that I work with, generally speaking, this is this is why they're doing what they do is because people are uh, seeing this. And for most of us, the things that we're sharing are passions, whether it's climbing or whatever it is for you. I know personally has been an important part. This is a big part of why those things are so important on a personal level, because this is how you sort of combat a lot of that stuff. And so if we're seeing a rise of isolation and lack of connection and community, and by the way, I see this in athletics uh, or, or the opportunity for athletics to solve a lot of this. I also see this with clients who are completely not involved in athletics. So for instance, we did a, a project recently it was almost a sort of a clubhouse, but it was really geared for 
uh, specifically a lot of ex uh, military folks who lose that connection when they leave, uh, you know, the service, or in this case, it was a special operations group, how there was a distinct lack of community after they leave that core group. And so it really creates a need for connection and innovation, you know, spaces for inclusion and belonging, you know, both individually and collectively, meaning places for you to thrive, you to experiment, but also collectively uh, together. And really the goal being to foster physical and mental health. And really it's about having spaces for the, the play and interaction and engagement. And that's really to me what this sort of new third space is, is that, you know, I know for me, it's not about not wanting to, I'm not trying to separate life and work because I like my work, but at the same time, there needs to be this relationship between the two of them and how we create spaces that allow you to make a phone call and step away or allow you to have some space to work while your kid's doing something else. These very simple relationships often are, are things that are ways of looking at these third spaces where rather than lit life, work and play being separated, how do we put them together, but in a way that actually support each other and aren't just um, sort of cannibalizing each other. Yep. Thank you, Hale. All right. And Kamal, what are practical ways to limiting spend once you're well into developing? Oh boy. Yeah without compromising what you're trying to build. Yep. What are simple ways to do so as in investing in certain amenities after opening, offering less programming until you're cash flowing, et cetera. Yeah. So just to summarize, you know, Kamal, great question. You know, I, it's funny because this is why that baseline that we talked about at the beginning, uh, this is exactly why to me, that's what we have to refer back to. And if it's something that maybe isn't as clear or just wasn't handled that way, I would just sort of reverse engineer it then and say, look, what is it that we actually do have to do now versus what we can do in the future? Like, what is it about our core idea that as the budget gets pushed or strained or whatever, that we have to hold on to and really just can't afford to not do or what's a minimum viable version of that or what elements if we if we can only do one out of three which is the most important one and to me that always goes back to that narrative of you being able to articulate what it is that you're trying to do how it works with the building uh in terms of the programming pieces and how that works with the bottom line so for instance if you're at the point where you know very specifically you know if you're going to invest in less amenities you know, is it, should we build a yoga room or not? You know, are you building that in the first place? Cause you really care about it. And one of your partners is a yoga teacher and you're going to do amazing classes, or should you potentially just kick that out and say, look, there's a whole bunch of these in our neighborhood. We're just gonna, um, we'll just partner with them or leverage them. And, and they just care about that more than we do. So we're not going to worry about it. Um, like what is it that are the core elements to your business that you do want to spend the money on. Because I do think there's ways of phasing projects. That's a sort of different topic that I uh, get into in different, uh, again, if you want more on that, I'm happy to get into that. But phasing projects, the one thing I would say is, so your question about building more later after your cash flowing, there are some things that are a lot easier to do than others with that. You know, moving, uh, when you're building things out, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, those kind of nuts and bolts things are really hard to do later. You can always add on to them, but when you're cutting holes in floors or when you're putting drains, things like that, the more of that you can get right at the very beginning, the better off you're gonna be downstream. You also can do it in a way where you potentially leave you know, uh, supply and drain locations or whatever for future things. So say you said, well, we're going to build a yoga room and maybe we want to do recovery down the line or we want to do big events, but we can't afford a big lighting package right now. You know, working with architects and engineers to spend a little bit now so that you're giving something to plug into in the future. And again, this is why, you know, so much of it is really strategy to me because, and it, and it has to involve the money part. Like when I talk with, architects on projects, 
I always work with other architects because I often work on the beginning part and then we work with other architects as we move forward in projects. So when they very often will say, well, what do you think about this or that? And the the very common answer is, well, I, I really can't give you an answer without some sort of a cost understanding. And so I, I'm always surprised how often, and you know, for me being trained as an architect, as a licensed architect, it I this was not how I was trained to work this way. This is just what I found works though, because it gets you thinking about this stuff earlier so that we just have fewer like shocks. And I say shocks because pricing is always surprising how expensive it is, especially these days. We've gone way up in the last three or four years, probably 30%. And it, it's not that it, it has gone down. It's just sort of flatlined. Whether or not you can charge enough to make that work for your business, that investment up front, meaning have your memberships gone up by 30%, like probably not. So we're in a situation where it's very common for you to go, wow, like, okay, the numbers are higher. What can we cut? Just what you're saying. And so, you know, what are ways we can do this? I mean, leaving space for build out in the future, that's one. It's, it's, tr it's, it's tricky to do that without um, sort of leaving a big hole <laughs> in a space, if you will. So it, it just, again, I think that this is where the technique of doing it has a lot to do with um, the the success of how it's going to look. Like if you leaving spaces that can be built out, maybe spaces that can be converted. You know, one thing looking at everything as an opportunity, uh, having an opportunity somewhere within it. You know, you may have a thesis on what it is that you think people want, but as you start to operate, it almost inevitably evolves from there. If you're not a business that has really, really dialed that in uh, over like many locations over many years. So as a new business, it may be an opportunity to say, let's leave some space to fill it in and let's figure out some stuff and see what people want and maybe leave it more flexible, which also means cheaper probably, meaning less built out, less specific. So you know, rather than building out a really nice yoga room, maybe it's a much more bare bones room that could be converted into a recovery room or a yoga room or, or something else down the road um, based on feedback. You know, you can make it more participatory in terms of getting feedback on what people actually want. You know, an example of that uh, very specifically was in, in a lot of the climbing gyms we did, uh, you know, again, 15 years ago, co-working wasn't necessarily something that we had planned on doing from the beginning. Some of that actually occurred talking with other people who that was what they were interested in. And they said, hey, wouldn't that be cool over here? Like, look at the view you'd get. Look how amazing that would be. It's like, yeah, that's a really good idea. So, you know, some of it actually gets added in late, just like some of it, I think, in, in the case of removing things can get added in or reversed, uh, removed, if you will. And so I think, but it comes down to when you're articulating the narrative, like when you're sitting there thinking, you know, what's the story of this project? What is it that we're really trying to do here? The pieces that tell that story the strongest are the pieces I would hold on to the most. And I talked with a group um, this year from Universal down in Orlando, and they're opening a gigantic, uh, project Epic uh, Universal Epic. It's like their new theme park. And I was speaking with their creative group. And I say that because he found me through that idea, that video on narrative architecture, because he was talking about they're opening this mega park, like massive, um, to basically either, I forget if it's replacing Universal Studios, but I mean, it's, you know, a huge project. And they were trying to finish it basically they're finishing it sort of right now and he was having the same problem of wow we just were running out of money how do we make decisions and what he thought was appealing about the idea of narrative is that you know when you're, he's dealing with thousands of people involved you know having a narrative that you actually can make decisions that support at every level and i bring them up because it's a very extreme case like a massive construction project at the very top, the story you're singing has to be able to sort of filter all the way through so that when whoever is making decisions about 
how much you spend on a different item or what color something ends up being, you know, purchased as like being able to reference something at the highest level is at least something that's giving them feedback when you're not actually there to do it. And so I think that's part of being a, a sort of visionary for projects is, is being able to develop that narrative because that's the thing that without you even realizing it uh, is being referenced all the time. All right. Yeah. Question from Jason. Uh, any insight on development decisions that seem to attract angel class of investors versus more return driven resources? Yeah. So basically, you know, how attracting people who are maybe <laughs> so the, just to categorize maybe a little bit differently. So investors who are a sort of private equity group versus uh, who might be just very hard on numbers or uh, versus somebody who, you know, cares about numbers, but also cares about the thing itself a little bit more, maybe. What I would say too, is that a lot of times private equity, private equity isn't in the cards for people who are just starting because those groups are often looking for, for big multiples or, or just bigger numbers in general. So taking like a actual uh, group off the table, but more of that type of investor you know, I, I think that it, it's tricky because you you're not going to be able to pick every probably every investor to be the perfect type of person. Like you, you there's a very real chance that you may need to bring in someone who sees opportunity and that's kind of all they care about. As long as they're not sort of meddling too too much in the sense of uh, as long as they believe in your vision enough, you know, they don't necessarily need to be someone who is like the most avid whatever that you're trying to do. Uh, with that being said, you know, the more positive side of that would be, how do we find the, the sort of perfect investor, like the angel type person? And what I always say, it's a lot like real estate where by getting on the ground and talking with people and having a package that you can share, pe share with people, meaning some numbers, that narrative, I think some visuals to sort of like entice people. Often what ends up happening is you'll meet someone or you'll be introduced to someone who may be in your circle. Maybe it's a friend of a friend. That's often more likely. And they'll often have someone who is, oh, actually that person is interested in the thing that you're, you're talking about. And so Finding people that are sort of loosely connected to you is a, is a common way that I see this happening. And finding someone who really has that passion that is much more keen on being a part of a project that they really like, um, not just a project that is sort of looked at in hardcore financial terms. And there's both out there, just like in real estate, there's landlords who will be a real booster for your project. And when I say that, we have put plaques and projects on the wall, like two landlords, because sometimes projects don't happen without a landlord that really likes what you're doing. Maybe they've done a bunch of boring crap. They've, they've sold a bunch of, uh, they've rented a bunch of places to, you know, dollar stores and they just, they don't, they're kind of over it for whatever reason. You know, a lot of them have pride in the fact that they might own this building in a really cool location, some cool old building, and they want something cool in it. You know, so finding the right fit is the word I always use, fit. And so whether it's with real estate or investors, or even frankly, architects and contractors, but putting them aside, the fit is the thing that I think is most important because that's the person who is probably going to be much more willing to go on the ride with you Hopefully they have assistance they can offer beyond just the money. But, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to answer. But what I would say is that those people are out there. It's just sometimes hard to find them. And I think it's easy to think, oh, I'm just not finding, I can't get a space. I can't get an investor. But then all of a sudden, and I, again, I say this because I've seen it with businesses I've, I'm currently and have worked with, you find one investor and you go from looking for 10 Till you find one and they just take it and they're the right partner. And it took you a while to find them. And I'm working with a company right now that this is what happened with they, where they were really having a tough time 
a lot of people and people on this call, I'm sure have heard this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. Talk to me, you know, send me stuff, blah, blah, blah. A lot of that. And then when it actually comes down to putting the writing the check there, the, the sort of tune changes quite a bit. And so that sort of false optimism uh, or, or optimism that doesn't actually follow through maybe uh, is very real, both with real estate and with partners and investors. But finding people and I the, the term angel, you know, I I don't it's funny, I don't really even know if that's what I would use. But my point is, is finding the right investor. It can take a while, but they are out there. And that's why being you know, you're not going to find them on the Internet. Probably you're going to find them through your connections. Uh, often you find them at conferences. Often you find them at, uh, you know, different ways that you can get to know people who know other people and you're offering them an opportunity. Just remember that, you know, you're looking for something from them. You need to partner, but they're, if they're an investor, they're looking for stuff to invest in. So, you know, you're not just sitting there in a sort of passive way. You have to be, you know, realize too, that you're offering something that has tremendous value, both as a solution to the problems that we're sort of talking about in this pyramid, but also as a way for them to make money. And if they're an investor, their job is to find investments to put money into. So, you know, I guess what I would say is just the way that you frame it. Um, that's how I would look at it. And, and it's, it's tricky. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Kamal. Yeah, Jason, I, I don't know if that sort of gets to the answer of it, but uh, hopefully that at least it, in that, you know, again, you can have a building and it's hard to find investors or you can have investment and it's hard to find a building. They don't necessarily mean the other one's going to happen easier. Um, all right. I'm just going to read Hale. Hale says uh, we're in a slow negotiation on a, on a leased space. A lot of landlord finance expansion, um, open questions about who will be covering costs, but I'm interested in pulling together an expert to help with the design. Yeah. So what I would say is, um, I'll just address that sort of generally is, you know, how do you put a team together for projects? Um, and when do you do that? You know, landlord work uh, versus you doing a lot of work. There's no right or wrong way. If you're have cash to put in and you can control the project, often I find that's easier because you can make decisions about where each dollar goes. When a landlord is controlling the work, there are potentially big problems that you're not in control of. And so you really don't control the budget at that point when it's not you hiring the team or contractors or whoever. Um, additionally, you know, bringing in I think depending on what kind of a project you're doing, you know, if you're bringing in people who have done projects similar, uh, I think that can be great. If you're bringing in people who are sort of looking at projects from one point of view in climbing, we see this a lot with climbing wall builders. It's not that it's a problem, but there is a bit of a conflict where they make money building climbing walls. My experience is often that the answer is less climbing walls because, you know, Spaces these days are 20 years ago, we used to jam as much climbing into a space as we could. Today, that really isn't the best result for the business. You're also saving money by putting less climbing wall in. But more importantly, I think what you're talking about is negotiating who's doing what part of projects. If a landlord's willing to give you cash and you do the work, I think that's by far the cleanest. Often landlords want to do work because I think they they see themselves providing value while spending less and giving less cash out of their pocket often, which is fine. But I do think that you have to be really careful with that because uh, I've seen it just over and over, including fairly recently, where landlord work, um, you might just be given the bill effectively uh, without much control. If you're at least controlling the work and there's a there's a pricing issue, you can say no. Uh, we need to figure out how to do this in a different way. You know, there was another question about how to save money sort of as you're getting further in projects. If you don't have control over the billing and the budget, which if the landlord's doing the work, you probably don't, 
uh, it can be really tricky because you might just be given the bill and expect to pay it. So the team structure and strategy there, I think is really important, just something to consider um, as you're talking about that stuff. Uh, but again, I'd be happy to get into that in more detail or more specifically in private. So if you want to reach out, please feel free. All right. Yeah. Happy to answer, Jason. And yeah, just um, if there's anything else, please shoot it through. Otherwise, uh, we can kind of call that a wrap. And again, please feel free to reach out uh, through the website or through the email that you've already gotten. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody hopping on today. What I would say <clears throat> just in just for the last few minutes. I can vamp a little bit on um, landlords. Excuse me. So little stories from the trenches. Landlord work um, <clears throat> is really tricky because a lot of them, maybe if they own a big building or multiple buildings or properties, they're kind of used to doing work. And so rather than giving you a million dollars just for ballparking, they will, in their mind, they're going to be giving you, um, they're going to be doing like, oh, it's a million dollars of work, but it might only cost them half that uh, or maybe three quarters of that because it's their own team or whatever it is. And so they are, in their mind, they're able to do work on their building and give you a lot of value while basically less out of their pocket. That can be fine. But again, almost more often than not, there comes a point even if it's all rah, rah, rah at the beginning, everybody's on the same team where they're going to make decisions that are not in your interest. It's far more in their interest to save money or, hey, we didn't think you needed that quality thing that we said we'd give you. We did a cheaper thing or we're actually not going to do that for you because, you know, we decided it's too much money and you don't have any control because it's not your budget. It's their budget that they're controlling and their subcontractors, et cetera. And you might be just told, by the way, here's the bill. You have to pay it um, without much leverage at that point. So, and it gets ugly. So what I would say though, to think about all of that is at the very, at the very least, think about that when you're making those initial agreements, because how is it that you can have a mechanism of control enough where that won't happen to you, or at least it won't happen to you sort of too easily? As in, is there a way that you can structure an agreement where there's some sort of cost control baked in for you as the tenant so that you're not just writing a blank check? Uh, I think it was last week I was talking with someone and as we were talking, that sort of, you know, it wasn't what we thought was going to happen, but you could reason it out where if somebody wanted to, that's a very real possibility if they were sort of a bad actor, you know. I think often, especially with contractors, um, I don't think they're necessarily trying to be like criminals and hit you with horrible change orders. But at the end of the day, they're everybody has their own self-interest. And so it can really feel that way. And so the point is thinking about the end at the beginning, like if this goes south or if we do get a bill or a change order that we're not happy with, how do we go about figuring that out? Or is there a way where we have certain approvals or, you know, just some way to try to have your arms around it? Uh, because landlord work is very common. Another thing that I would say is keeping their work on the more simple side. So things like, yeah, clean the interior, paint the interior, make sure the air conditioning works. Some of those are like big items that are relatively simple to draw a line with where you're not having to parse. I mean, I've had projects where, oh yeah, we'll install the plumbing, but not the fi finishes. It's like, how does that even work from a permitting perspective? You're going to build the thing, but not put finishes on it. Like it, it's, you know, it very quickly sort of falls apart um, in terms of like very practical issues when it starts getting too simple, uh, murky. So I would say keep it simple because it's often a, a much better way to simplify life, uh, draw the line in the sand about who's responsible for what in a very clear way, you know, Hey, make sure our air conditioning works, uh, you know, clean the space, paint it, you know, maybe, uh, run, run, you know, basic stuff, but we'll, we'll take care of all the finishes that we really care about, uh, because that's where you're going to care more than they do. 
So a little bit of a tangent there, but uh, hopefully that's helpful. And I'll be following up with people uh, with a replay link for this as well. So thank you again, uh, everybody for joining. I really appreciate your time. And hopefully that was, hopefully that was helpful. I'll talk to you soon.